Thank you, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you also to Taima May, who uh, was uh, with me at the Brigham at one point. I don't see her uh, right now, but uh, we, we worked together. Oh, there she is, yes. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Um, my flight made it in this morning. I was very excited. Uh, there was quite a bit of delay. So um, I had time at the airport during the delay to change my slides. So you will notice, uh, for those of you that are looking up uh, the slides online or, or have the slides that, uh, of course, I, I changed them. So, uh, But I look forward to talking to you uh, about radiation and cervical cancer. I realize everyone's hungry and wants to get to lunch, uh, so I will go as quickly as uh, we can uh, while still covering all the major information. So. Um, they're my disclosures. We're going to talk. You, you just heard uh, Dr. Latau advocate for MRI. I'm a strong advocate for MRI for different reasons, uh, but basically uh, we'll talk a little bit about the management of locally advanced cancers and how we rely on MRI for that, uh, and then also talk about how we use MR to help guide radiation treatments with brachytherapy and some new innovations in those areas. Um, I, you've all heard cervical cancer and know that it's a very global disease, uh, the third most common cause of death with about 12,000 new cases of invasive cancer in the United States. The good news, though, is that it does appear that the global incidence is declining based on expected, not in terms of absolute numbers. Of course, the absolute number of cervical cancer cases is increasing. But as the population grows and as the population ages, we would expect about 663,000 cases if we do a 10-year uh, survey from 2005 to an update to 2015. So the fact that we're still somewhat plateaued at 525,000 means that we're just starting to make a dent into uh, curing this. Now, of course, um, that is in very selected parts of the world where um, vaccination and, and adequate treatment are available, but I do think that it's a sign that there's hope that there may be a day when this is an eradicated disease. Uh, there are, unfortunately, still 266,000 deaths in the world uh, due to cervical cancer, almost all in young women in <clears throat> underserved parts of the world. Of course, it all starts with a woman coming in for uh, com complaining of bleeding or some uh, abnormalities or having a routine exam. And uh, just to emphasize the importance of doing a routine uh, bimanual examination and a rectovaginal examination to determine whether someone has locally advanced disease, this can present in many different ways. Obviously, there can be an enlarged mass, but sometimes it's almost hidden as a, a tumor that's behind what appears to be a normal cervix in the rectovaginal examination is where you can feel the bulk of the tumor pressing against the rectum or extending out to the parametria. So it's just really crucial to always do that. Um, and of course, I think everyone here does, um, of course, do uh, routine workup if something abnormal is identified, uh, including an exam under anesthesia if indicated. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to advocate for MRI. We have seen a decrease in the use of EUA uh, as more and more surgeons refer for MRI up front when seeing an abnormality. And so there's less, I think, discussion between the radiation oncologist and the surgeon in the OR. Um, when I started this, you know, 17 years ago, we used to do EUAs on every single case and um, would then kind of work through the management issues. And I think nowadays the reliance on MR means that the workup kind of happens separate and not in the OR environment. Um, and so there's, there's less opportunity uh, to talk about the, the treatments and the op opportunity for surgery or radiation. Kind of the decision is made based on an MRI, even though um, the data didn't really advocate that we should use an MRI for staging. However, MRIs are quite helpful and, um, and relatively accurate. Uh, are we over uh, treating some patients? I think that the uh, number of patients that have uh, more extensive disease based on an, uh, an MRI than not is, is small, that the sensitivity uh, of an MRI is uh, over 90 percent. So we're, we're doing a good job with it. Um, but we still rely on the FIGO-based um, 
criteria, which include cystoscopy and rectosigmoidoscopy, determine whether or not there's stage 4A disease. And then because this is a global disease, the chest X-ray labs, et cetera, are used, uh, including an optional now, of course, we don't do lymphangiogram, but bone scans to determine whether or not there's metastatic disease. In the U.S., we always do a PET scan on every single cervix case because it is uh, covered by Medicare and Medicaid, um, and that is routine. Um, it is uh, uh, not an issue to get a PET scan. An MRI is more controversial and is based on insurance providers. Um, CT is not an issue, but we rarely, because PET scans are approved, we rarely get just a CT. <clears throat> HPV, everyone knows, is the primary culprit, with 16 and 18 being the top two. HPV 18 is more aggressive and presents with more lymph node involvement and distant metastases. The vaccine covers type 16 and 18, and now the newest version, the nine-valent vaccine, has added in types 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58, just to review. Um, there are data coming out of Asia that there are differences in radiation response based on HPV subtype. So when you ask why radiation has cured cervix cancer since 1906, uh, we say that uh, the vast majority of those cases were cured because uh, they were HPV 16, and it's very easy to get good responses with HPV 16. HPV 18, as I mentioned, higher risk of lymph node involvement and distant metastases. And you can see in this data that came uh, from Southeast Asia, the best response to chemo radiation. So basically, um, uh, the benefit to chemo radiation may be HPV subtype dependent. And that's data that has not been replicated. We need trials from countries where there are very large numbers of patients, and we need subtype analysis to be done accurately on all of those patients to confirm this. But I think as we think about where we can take cervical cancer in the future, particularly its sensitivity to the adjuvant treatments that do have toxicities associated with them, we want to think about potentially de-escalating treatment in patients that are highly sensitive to potentially lower doses of radiation and adding treatment that is adding um, either, whether it be uh, in trials, uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy like outback therapy or immunotherapy in those that are going to have the most sensitive responses to those types of treatments. So I think this is a ripe area for future study. Now, the mechanism of HPV has been described, and everyone I think here probably knows that the uh, virus has envelope capsid proteins, E6 and E7 have traditionally been shown to suppress the tumor suppressor genes, P53 and RB. There have been TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, Proteomic Landscape papers that look at all of the various upregulations um, uh, on the proteomic level, and these recategorized cervical cancer into three major subgroups. Keratin low, which was generally HPV 16 and 18, keratin high, which was squamous cell but all other types, and then an adenocarcinoma rich group. And within that, they found 5% that were actually endometrial cancer-like, that were comprised predominantly of HPV-negative tumors that had all the mutations that one would associate with endometrial cancer rather than cervical cancer. They had high frequencies of KRAS, ARID1A, and P10 mutations. So that there is a small segment of endocervical adenocarcinoma that is actually more endometrial. We've all known that clinically, that there are elderly women that don't have significant risk factors with HPV uh, exposure or that, uh, you know, it's hard to tease out, uh, but that these tumors behave like endometrial cancer because they are, even though they're just in the cervix, and subsequent, should they relapse, subsequent treatment may need to be different because of these mutations. So the targeted therapies of the future will actually end up needing to be more based on, say, their P10 positivity than on the fact that it was originally coded as a cervical cancer. And so that's where I think the TCGA is going to give us the best um, help for the future. They also showed amplification in the immunotherapy type targets, uh, and that I think also uh, was quite helpful. Now, there's always been a controversy about whether adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma is uh, worse. Uh, 
uh, you know, adenocarcinoma is known to uh, present and behave differently than squamous cell carcinoma. From a radiation oncologist perspective, this GOG amalgamation of five prospective trials, which had over 1,600 patients, was quite helpful. Uh, and it showed that adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma had different overall survival rates when the patients were treated with radiation alone. But if you treated with chemo radiation, that difference went away. And you might ask why, like why, why would that make sense? Well, adenocarcinomas and, and squamous cell carcinomas that are four centimeters or larger, if you see a lot of these clinically and treat them, you'll notice that the shrinkage is slower with adenocarcinomas. Their natural history is such that they tend to have a slower regression rate with chemoradiation. What does that mean in terms of, of why there would be a survival difference with adenocarcinomas? Generally, the most important part of the radiation course, the one that really cures the patient, is the brachytherapy because that's when we're giving an incredibly high dose of radiation to the core or the center of the tumor where basically you have the greatest number of stem cells that might you know, uh, cause a relapse. And so we, we are uh, treating in an adenocarcinoma after five weeks of external beam, a slightly larger tumor than we would with a squamous cell, which generally regresses at a much faster rate, about a centimeter per week. So if you're treating with radiation alone and you're using the old technique of brachytherapy as these GOG trials did, which was LDR or treating to what we called at that time point A, you're going to miss potentially the edges of the tumor that are beyond your brachytherapy distribution. And so with chemo radiation, you're somewhat accelerating that response rate. You get a slightly faster regression rate. And so even if you're doing point A-based brachytherapy, you will cure the tumor because you're now point A is covering the full extent of the edges of the tumor. So I think in reality, this is a, a advocacy, not so much for chemo radiation, although of course it is, but for um, dose escalation with brachytherapy. It's one interpretation of this. Now, there are many um, prognostic factors, age, histology, uh, race, uh, performance status, nodal status, stage, et cetera. The most important of these is stage. Why stage is correlated with uh, tumor size? Tumor size is the, the amount of disease present at diagnosis is the most predictive for relapse. This, these nomograms were, again, accumulation of that GOD data that I mentioned. Uh, this was published in JCO, and there is an app on, well, I have an iPhone, so it's on my iPhone, but I think everybody should be able to, to get the app. And these apps are, are actually quite helpful for both endometrial and cervical cancer. I make our residents get them all because you can calculate local regional recurrence uh, for even your stage 1A grade 2 patient. Uh, and uh, be fairly consistent because this is, again, all five GOG randomized trials amalgamated into one data set. So um, not to advertise apps, but it's helpful clinically. Um, the staging system changed in, in the fall of 2018, and now, um, of course, the uh, elements required are the same, but it did divide the uh, stage 1B into 1B1, 2, and 3, less than 2 centimeters, 2 to 4, and greater than 4 centimeters, and also allowed lymph nodes now in calls 3C1, which is pelvic node positive, just like in uterine cancer, and 3C2, which is periortic node positive. So this is the very first time in 100 years, really, that we can now accurately identify uh, nodal um, disease in a staging system. And, uh, and that will, I think, affect and improve outcomes for patients in countries where they have limited access to CT because it will prompt those women to get the CT scan. As I mentioned in the US, we look for nodal metastases by uh, PET scan, and this shows a supraclavicular node, which does still have a potential cure rate, although it's low um, at 5 to 10 percent at five years. But we. Um, use this information in terms of directing therapy. PET uh, identified lymph nodes are independently prognostic, so uh, identifying pelvic, periortic, supraclavicular nodes uh, is independently prognostic and determines outcome. We do dose escalate with radiation to all of these involved nodes, 
uh, and have changed the course of therapy. When I started in 2002, we did not have the ability to do dose escalation. We treated everybody with APPA fields to 45 gray, and it was considered palliative if patients had enlarged periaortic nodes. Not pelvic nodes, but periaortic nodes. Um, and the reason why we couldn't take the dose any higher was because the spinal cord has a limit of 45 gray. The kidneys have a limit of 18 gray. And all of those normal tissues were so close that we had to limit our fields um, and limit the dose that we could give. What happened with the advent of IMRT in 2003, IMRT is very, very focal or conformal radiation. It took our computers to become fast enough and the machines to become accurate enough to move in a robotic way around the patient. But at, with the advent of IMRT, we can now target specific lymph nodes regardless of size, and we do what's called dose painting. We can actually deliver the dose in a much more focal way to that lymph node without having to um, uh, limit the dose based on the normal tissue structures as much. We, of course, still record them. But by giving, instead of 45 gray, 65 gray to the periodic nodes, all of a sudden, we changed it from a 0% cure rate to an 86% cure rate. And that is why the staging system now incorporates stage 3C2, whereas it used to be periodic nodes were considered stage 4 and incurable. Um, and that is, is really just uh, uh, advocacy for appropriate dose escalation of um, patients that are potentially curable um, due to limited nodal disease. So there are several publications on this. This one um, from MD Anderson, we published this um, also back in 2013, showing that dose escalation, uh, the median dose was 63. Now people do this up to 65 gray uh, and with lymph node sizes uh, up to two to three centimeters, um, the nodal control rate 86%. In this particular series, the overall survival rate 68%. And that's instead of giving, as I mentioned, just um, chemo alone uh, and giving you know, definitive treatment to those nodes. The post-treatment PET uh, has been published. This was back in 2007 in JAMA to be predictive of survival. So we, um, it is mandated to get a, a PET scan three months after everyone completes treatment. And if there's a partial response in the cervix, that we then biopsy the cervix and recommend an adjuvant hysterectomy at that point if there is residual disease or an evaluation. Of course, it depends on the extent of disease at that time. But if someone has a stage 4A tumor and residual disease, they may or may not be a candidate for an exempt at that point. Um, the MRI, as I mentioned before, is highly variable at diagnosis, but very, very helpful in terms of our radiation treatment planning, particularly as our fields have gotten much smaller and more encompassing of just the tumor. So you can have exophytic tumors. You can have that kind of hidden tumor I mentioned before, which is more endophytic uh, and extends posteriorly along the rectal wall, but it's really not so visible in the vagina. Or you can have tumors. The patient that was on the right presented uh, with... Uh, you know, an absolutely normal tiny cervix, but had this incredibly, she presented with constipation and had this incredibly large mass that was extending off the back lip of the cervix, pressing her rectum, but her cervix itself looked normal, pretty normal. Um, so, you know, the, there can be all kinds of irregular presentations. This is the epitome of individualized care. In order to give radiation to treat these tumors, you have to, uh, again, truly look at, at where the disease is. The way we're using MRI to do this is by uh, using multi-parametric MRI. So the standard T2-weighted image is shown at the top. At the bottom left, we're looking at hypoxia MRI. These were developed initially for brain tumors, but you look and see uh, wh whether or not it's called the T2 star region shows you areas of hypoxia. In the ADC map, you're looking at the density of the tumor cells, so where there are regions of the um, uh, thickest or largest amount of uh, tumor deposits. And then post-contrast or uh, diffusion-weighted and uh, dynamic contrast-enhanced tumors show you where there's the largest regions of blood flow, so the vascularity of the tumor. What happens during radiation? Well, these are uh, T2-weighted images and show how the tumor has shrunk, basically about a centimeter per week, but it's not always in uniform directions. 
Uh, and so it is important to analyze that because it helps us with our brachytherapy implant and that targeted dose that comes at the end. Um, and there is data that shows that the rate of regression during the external beam radiation is predictive of outcome. So, you know, it's kind of common sense. You know this from clinical exam, but the more residual the disease uh, amount is after five weeks of external beam, um, the lower the local control rate and therefore the disease-specific survival rate. One of the things we all know, cervical cancer, fortunately, is a type of cancer that stays in a local area for quite a while in most cases and only metastasizes to distant sites if either it's a certain type of histology like small cell carcinoma or uh, if it has a very rapid proliferation rate, which is a minority of tumors. The vast majority of these cases spread locally to the parametria before they spread to the liver, for example. So if we can capture or cure these patients with local treatment, surgery for the earliest stage, chemo radiation for those that have uh, bulky tumors or spread, those patients are actually curable. So in radiation, we use MR to help us with our contouring. What's contouring? Contouring is our way of defining where the beams of radiation are going to go. And we did a study um, with all the radiation oncologists um, that were part of the, at that time, the RTOG, now part of the NRG group. Uh, and we did these atlases looking at where our um, our differences are. So, you know, you know that if you take one surgeon and operate and you take another surgeon and operate, their operation techniques may be very different. Even if you trained with the same person, um, there's a lot of individuality in who we are and how we do things, and that's just human nature. Radiation oncologists have this ability to judge what another person did because it's all recorded. Surgeons, you don't really know what each other did because unless you have a videotape showing you know, where exactly you made your incision, you can't really compare each other very well. Radi What's that? Even with a video, it's hard, right? So you can tell maybe if the patient's lymph nodes were tracked or something that these lymph nodes were removed. But there's, there's so much nuance to how we do things that we wanted to look how different radiation oncologists were and kind of track it. So we contoured the cervix on an MRI, and this was done independently. Everybody got the scans at their own institution, contoured them, and then we compared each other. And what we found, not surprisingly, is that, yes, we have a lot of individual variability. Um, it wasn't bad, but it was, it was worse in the areas that we care about the most, which was concerning. So, for example, um, the cervix had a level of agreement that was only moderate if we contour the cervix on an MRI. And we picked the MRI because it's obviously the best imaging technique that we have. A PET has kind of um, uh, very irregular borders on the edge. Uh, the uterus was actually better. It was easier to define the edge of the muscle wall. Now, of course, tumor makes those edges less clear. So, and you get the next, the heterogeneity of where does the cervix turn into the vagina and where, of course, are the parametria. So the cervix and the parametria, the organs that we care about the most, had the most amount of variability radiation oncologist to radiation oncologist. So the conclusion of the group to be safe, because we obviously want to all treat all the disease, was that instead of relying on very, very tight treatment approaches, that the best thing was to cover what ended up being the area of agreement of 95% of the whole uh, group, which was the entire cervix, parametria, and uterus. So we actually treat quite a bit more in some ways than where just the diseases, but this is a safety quality factor that we built into our treatment planning. Just in case you, you know, take a look at your radiation oncologist plans or are a radiation oncologist yourself, that's why we do it. But there's of course organ motion. So not only do we draw these large areas, we have to take into account the fact that we're, we're hitting it with these fine beams, yet the tumor is shrinking and the bladder and rectum are moving, and how do we take that into account with our treatments? So we do something called the cone beam CT on the machine every single day. And in a study, we found that if you gave, if you contoured out where the tumor was and you said, okay, the error for the margin would be 1.5 centimeters, we found that in about 30 
90% of the treatments, the tumor would be out of your field. So that means that you have to give at least two to three centimeters of margin in order to encompass all the areas of disease accounting for the variability that occurs day to day. In this study, they said 3.5 centimeters would encompass a CTV for every, every case. Now going back to that multi-parametric MRI, after external beam, what does it show? You could see here that exact same case, the T2 sagittal um, axial on the top, and now the differences in that hypoxia map and the uh, DWI and on the DCE, the contrast enhanced scan, and you can see how drastically different they are from where they were before. Not only has the tumor shrunk, but you can actually pick out the areas where there's residual disease. So on the ADC map, for example, in the bottom middle, it's the areas that are black, dark. That's where you have dense tumor cell infiltrates left behind after 45 grave external beam. So what do we do? Well, we use brachytherapy. And in this case, this is that same case on the left at week three and on the right at week five extra, after external. But the key on the right is that this is when we inserted our brachytherapy implant. And although it doesn't show up very well, um, there are little um, dots in here and each dot is a brachytherapy needle that's been inserted into the areas of residual disease, we can map this then on to the MRI with the ADC map and dose escalate to the areas where there's the greatest amount of residual disease. So those are, of course, on trial. But there are ways to help us fine tune where we're giving our brachytherapy dose so that we don't have to treat a whole region uh, as we used to in the past. We're becoming much more refined and much more precise with our ability to dose brachytherapy. Now, why are we still giving brachytherapy? Well, because it works. This is Howard Kelly, who was at Hopkins. This was published in JAMA in 1915. He's one of the founding uh, fathers of the field in OBGYN, uh, brought the radical hysterectomy to the US from Vienna and, uh, and worked on, on various surgical procedures here. But also, when coming back from Europe, went to Poland, went to the mines uh, where they were uh, uh, retrieving the ore out of the ground, and had heard of a couple of doctors in Europe in Poland that were giving radium and curing cervix cancer. And so flew back from Europe in 1912 with a pocket full of uranium um, type <laughs> radium ore in his pocket. You can't imagine doing that nowadays, but that's what he did. So no TSA back then. And uh, so he treated at Hopkins uh, until 1915, 213 locally advanced cases defined as ones that he could not do a, a radical hysterectomy on at that time. Uh, and he cured 57 of those 200 cases with radium alone, just needles. So, you know, these are the early signs that brachytherapy is actually really the effective part of the treatment. What's the difference? Why don't we just do brachytherapy? Well, because as I mentioned earlier, the tumor spreads to lymph nodes. So brachytherapy just treats the tumor. And if you're you know, dealing with a limited case, you may or may not cover uh, the nodes adequately. What we've learned, unfortunately, in the United States is that since we've developed IMRT and those more advanced techniques, the utilization of brachytherapy declined because people were relying more on doing IMRT with dose escalation, including to the cervix, and that resulted in a survival decrease in locally advanced cervix in the United States because people were not doing brachytherapy. And this was uh, duplicated now in several studies. You can see here an 11% reduction in brachytherapy occurred over a 10-year period. That resulted in a 14% reduction in survival. So we know that brachytherapy is important, and it gives less normal tissue dose than external beam techniques, and it moves with the patient, but it gives an extremely high dose around the areas where the needles are located uh, or where the tandem is located. So generally, in the US, we do high dose rate, five fractions. There's pulse dose rate done very commonly in Europe, and LDR done um, sporadically in about 10 to 15% uh, of places in the United States. Um, and we know that treatment duration matters, so it's important to treat as quickly as possible. Uh, but generally, no more than eight weeks is our limit from the time of diagnosis to the completion of brachytherapy. So the faster these patients can get in and get their treatment, the better their survival rates. Survival decreases 0.6% per day when you go over eight weeks. <laughs> 
Um, there are many applicators, just to show you what we do. The bottom uh, middle is a picture of our latest, which I um, think our construction colleagues would find. It's, it's like 15 different components. It's, you know, it takes a lot to put it together, but it's a lot of fun because you can individualize where you're putting the brachytherapy um, in relation to the tumor. So it's, it's become, it, it's no longer one size fits all. We're not doing just TNOs anymore. The tandem is, however, the most important part, and so it's important not just to rely on needles. The tandem delivers the core high dose directly to the uh, intrauterine canal and to the cervix. We use ultrasound to help us find the intrauterine canal, and it uh, allows us to go very quickly with the insertion. And we need 3D imaging in order to appropriately do this. Some of you may work with your radiation oncologist and do laparoscopic guidance, fluoroscopic guidance, um, CT guidance, it, it all depends. Uh, laparoscopic is used most to detect where the needles are and determine that there's no perforation of the bowel with the insertion of the needles. So it, it really just depends on how you're doing this. Uh, sometimes if you have real-time imaging, the imaging and MRI or CT can tell you where the needles are going. We started with uh, 0.5 Tesla MR at the Brigham back in uh, 2004 and treated 25 cases and found that this real-time MR approach, putting the brachytherapy catheter in while the patients were in the MR magnet was um, extremely effective at localizing the disease and we were surprised because it resulted in no local recurrence. So, and this was a surgical MR that was mainly constructed for neurosurgeons to use for brain tumor resection that we just basically adopted uh, for occasional GYN cases. Um, but you can see that back in 2007, 2% of radiation oncologists were using, which was basically two people on the study, um, were using MRI scans in 2007, and that leaped up to 38% in 2014, and is even uh, further ahead now. So. Okay. Um, so what we know is that we're just treating a much more refined target, and we're um, using the newer nomenclature, the CTV. So the normal tissues that we contour, the bladder, rectum, and sigmoid, and that's to try to reduce the dose to them, which we were never able to do when we did 0.8 type prescriptions, certainly not as precisely as we do nowadays. The, this, of course, improved survival as um, was shown in France in this study. Uh, there was about a 9% improvement in overall survival from the use of image-guided brachytherapy. But the most important point of image-guided brachytherapy is a 20% reduction in toxicity. So again, improvement in overall survival, but a reduction in toxicity. And I will just say that most centers have CT. CT does a great job. It, gives you a slightly larger set of contours, but it covers the tumor quite well. So if all you have is a CT, again, these are these looking at how different we are kind of studies, but we found that people contouring on CT versus MR gave exactly the same results when we had a stage 1B2 tumor, but the difference came, the advantage for MR was when we had parametrial extension or a poor response from external beam in the parametria. And that's why we do MR guidance for the larger tumors. The EMBRACE studies from Europe have shown that dose escalation actually to the residual disease called the GTV uh, is important and that um, we can compensate for taking a longer treatment time by dose escalation, but of course then you run into the potential side effects of radiation side toxicity. Um, so I did a study that compared MRI versus CT and looked at local control and survival and showed that MRI did seem to have in this pilot uh, study where the MR was done on a prospective trial. Um, a, a, an apparent survival advantage that needs to be replicated in a much, much larger series, likely with international uh, accrual. But um, it, there's uh, uh, certainly a lot of data coming out of Europe uh, that MR uh, is, is worthwhile. So you'll see that there um, are ways to optimize tumor coverage with needles, as I mentioned. This is one of the new devices that we've worked on, um, that I worked with Ehud Schmidt on at the Brigham, where we built into the um, brachytherapy stylet, which is the part that holds the catheter, 
Um, we built in microcoils that pick up the signal from the MR. So as we're inserting the brachytherapy applicator on a screen, th this is like an external pelvic body coil on an MR, but it's actually in the brachytherapy catheter. So it's, it's an electronic component that's built into the brachytherapy device itself. And that allows us to see the MR um, on the screen from the relationship of the brachytherapy applicator. So we can place it exactly where there's residual disease and be much more precise than we are when we just place it blindly in an operating room um, without any imaging. So it's made the procedure itself go much, much faster for patients that have these large, bulky tumors. The, the, we're not talking about the stage 1B2s that have had a complete response by the completion of external beam. We're talking about the stage 3B type patients with the large amount of disease extending out of, uh, along the uterus sacral ligament towards uh, the rectum, and it's very, very hard to get the brachytherapy dose back there. You add needles and you use tracking and you'll be precise in your placement, reduce the dose to the rectum, and really uh, cure the patient due to uh, adequate treatment of those regions. So we've done this. This was a publication a couple years ago on 11 patients. We've obviously uh, done many more since then um, and just showed that it was feasible and that um, it significantly reduced our, um, our uh, distance from the catheter to the tumor. We also place um, spacing. This was work done with Antonio D'Amato um, at the Brigham where we looked and saw that um, placing hydrogel uh, between the rectum and the tumor or between the bladder and the tumor resulted in spacing uh, around the cervix so that we were able to, um, again, uh, reduce our normal tissue uh, potential complications. So these are just, uh, if there are any radiation oncologists in the audience, the newest updated dose goals from the EMBRACE study. Uh, the EMBRACE 2 has updated the rectum and the bladder dose constraints. It's reduced them based on uh, publications that came out of Institute Gustave Roussy that are cited. Um, but we have all of these, the contouring guidelines and the dose constraints, et cetera, all published in the journal of the ICRU in, in 2016. This also defines uh, for our physicists what our required nomenclature is for those contours. So I want to conclude and say thank you for the invitation again. Um, I couldn't do this without a big team that has uh, worked with me, that's worked on, on writing up these uh, research, all the students and nurses and therapists, and so um, uh, we're I'm very grateful to have worked with many good people over the years. Thank you.